six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at two thirteen. And it is clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of science. What is going on, everybody? It's Conley here, Science Nights in the Morning, and boy, do we have a show for you today. I'm sure you've kind of read the news about the murder hornets. Well, we have a very special guest. We have the whole crew here as well, and we have uh, Dr. Thomas Schiller, Dr. Anurban Bhattacharjee, and Dr. Sean Graham here in the house. Not in the house so much uh, from uh, Honor Bond, but we have the wonders of technology to get him on the air. And Sean, will you like to introduce uh, the special guest that you yeah. brought in today? Yeah, we, we have a special guest. I was doing, I was reading up on this whole thing and I, I started stumbling over, you know, what the hell's the difference between a hornet and a wasp and a, and a bee? And a, it's so confusing. And I, I know that there's a person out there who knows this stuff like the back of her hand, a uh, recent Sol Ross graduate, uh, Master Lauren Garrett. We're going to probably call her Master. She's just Master got her done with her Master, so we'll call All her right. Master <laughs> Lauren Garrett. Lauren, why don't you start off by just t- tell us a little bit about yourself and, and maybe why you love bugs so much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, the origin story of Lauren Garrett. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, so I started uh, my degree for my undergrad, actually at a different university, and then found myself back here at Saras about halfway through that process, and wasn't really sure what I was interested in. I knew I wanted to do biology, but I wasn't sure what. And so I got the opportunity to take some really awesome uh, summer courses. One with Dr. Graham here, his desert ecology course, which is super awesome. And then I also took a giant entomology class. And, and so uh, it really sparked my fascination and curiosity with insects, um, specifically flies. Mm-hmm. So I really like the challenge of flies. Flies are really tricky insects to identify. Um, there's all these different parts and characters that are difficult about them. Um, they tend to come up with their own terms for all these parts. So the typical parts that you associate with insects, there's all these other extra parts. And then dipterists, so people who study flies, like to go in and make up their own terms for all of those things. Wow. And so so <laughs> the, all the same parts in a fly that would be on a bee are named different things? For, even though they're the pretty much the same part? Yes. <laughs> That's ludicrous. So. Super confusing. I already don't want to be an entomologist. So. Have you ever talked with Kendall Craig? Of course. Yeah, yeah. he's super into that stuff. Yeah, he's very much invertebrate. Biology. Well, cool. But we were talking to the right person because that's that's where I was having trouble. Um, yeah. I did I did some reading and and you know, uh, but I'm kind of a vertebrate guy, so I'm glad that we brought in the heavy guns here to get us through. Um, maybe that's what we can start with. Uh, what's the difference between a wasp, a hornet, and and a bee? All right. So I think the first thing we should talk about is what makes something a hymenopteran. Yes. So a hymenopteran is the order of insects that bees, wasps, and ants belong to. Mm-hmm. And the reason they're all grouped together is because the females of hymenopterans, um, they have this egg-laying device called an ovipositor. All insects have some form of ovipositor. But in hymenopterans, the ovipositor is modified into a stinging apparatus, so hmm. a way to inject venom. And that's kind of what defines that group. So instead of eggs, it's filled with venom. Well, right. sometimes it's also filled with eggs. Oh, and, oh okay. um, it can be. There's things like tarantula hawks, for example, yeah. which uh, have actually a pore underneath their, the modified ovipositor. So they've actually evolved a separate spot to drop those eggs. So some, they still use the ovipositor to lay eggs, and then others, they've modified it in a different way. So Very cool. Yeah. Well, okay, I have to ask this question. Now, now we've uh, talked about scorpions on a recent uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, it was really a cool, fun episode. And we kind of broke the ice a little bit about uh, telling uh, stories of when we were stung. Yeah. Right? And so, <laughs> I mean... You're it, trying to segue this into the tarantula hawk, aren't you? Oh. Conley's been <laughs> shopping at the bit to ask about so tarantula hawks. I love tarantula, tarantula, tarantula hawks. Hawk yeah. They're so awesome. Yeah, before, before Conley gets into the tarantula hawks, there's a tarantula and a hawk. So this is like a weird hybrid, so there's like a, there's a like it has like eight wings or something like that. I was like, what is this thing, tarantula hawk? 
So he's asking if the tarantula hawk has eight wings is or it a if it's a hybrid of a tarantula, tarantula and a hawk. And a, and a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool if it, if it did. Um, no, so all insects have six legs. And then most insects have two pairs of wings. So there's some insects that break that rule. So things like true flies, for example, have only one pair of wings, so two wings total. And that's another good thing to try to not get confused with bees and wasps, because there are some flies that tend to look a lot like the types of bees and wasps. And so something you can always do is try to count the number of wings on the insect. So if you're unsure if it's something that can sting you, or maybe it's just a harmless fly, you can count the wings. So flies have two wings, and then things like bees and wasps have four wings total. So Hmm. that's a good way to try to mitigate just swatting things. Randomly, yeah, yes. we don't encourage right. that in general anyway. I have a bug assault gun. It's a it's a gun, that, but it has salt in it, and it's for the flies and in, in, inside. It's really fun. <laughs> Shoot you're, salt. You're talking to a dipterist. <laughs> you get a, oh, I'm sorry. You, you're, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry you're, you're assaulting our guests. I wish. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, you know, be friends with them. But honor one, the tarantula hawk. It's just a, a big uh, wasp. The, that's called that because they go after tarantulas. Yeah. Yes. Not but, a hybrid between a tarantula and a hawk. And a hawk. <laughs> but we, we don't want to talk about tarantula hawks yet because this show is about murder hornets. Right. And so the big thing that's all over the news right now is that a new kind of hornet that's not native to the U.S. has turned up on our shores. It's been found. What is a hornet? Uh, so it's been found in Washington State. And Anurban, his first question was, what's a hornet? Okay, so a hornet is a type of wasp. Yeah. And typically the hornets that we think about are things like yellow jackets, for example. Mm-hmm. So these are insects that are eusocial. So eusocial insects are those kinds of bees and wasps that form hives. So mm-hmm. they, they make those hives, kind of like bees do, um, as well as like paper wasps that form those nice cells to yeah. brood their young. So things like hornets, so things like yellow jackets, will create those hives and also tend to be very particular about defending those hives. And that's why when we think of hornets or yellow jackets, those are usually the ones we think about that are chasing after people and mm, really to aggressive. protect their brood. So. And this new hornet, it's an Asian giant hornet, is, is the common name that I guess is floating around. And then, of course, the media took it and turned it into the murder hornet, <laughs> sure. just like that, within five seconds. Mm-hmm. And I guess this thing, it, it specializes on taking down um, honeybee colonies. Yeah, so what it does is it gets into the hive and it starts to decapitate Oh, wow. Yeah, um, its major source of protein is, is honeybees. Yeah, so things mm-hmm. like hornets and these types of wasps are typically scavengers. So what they do mm-hmm. is they go and find other insects, sometimes spiders or arthropods, and they paralyze those insects usually with their toxins or their venom, and they shove those into their nest, and that's how they feed their young. Right. So these types of hornets are attacking bees using that as their food. To feed and their they're poison. big. They're like two inches long. Yes. And yeah, they can Google yeah. a picture of them yeah. and, and check yeah. them out. They look they're cartoon-like, good. honestly. So in the places that's, in Asia where they occur, there are like native honeybees and they're domestic honeybees, and they go in there and they can just clean out a honeybee hive because... Um, although some of the honeybees, I guess, in Asia have defenses against them. Right. So there's a particular uh, subspecies in Japan that has made the ability to basically form a mass around mm-hmm. the hornet. And then they and kill uh, them by, they, they, they overheat them, right? Right. So they kind of gyrate and they move and they create it's this heat crazy. and it cooks the hornet oh, yeah. actually oh, right. on the inside yeah. out. This, is, this um, is something I remember from a documentary several years ago about these things. That I thought was really incredible is as you as you mentioned they invade a hive, but the coolest thing about it is you don't think of a of a bee as being an incredibly intelligent animal, right? Mm. Although built into them, they you have, don't. I don't. Okay. But <laughs> dinosaurs are much more intelligent. Uh, but you, uh, but built in built into to to their wiring is this ability to to generate heat, like you said. But they know exactly when to cut it off. And that's the thing I thought was, was most spectacular was um, like a, maybe a degree above it, and correct me if I'm wrong, would actually kill the bees. So they have to stay within this threshold of, of heat to kill the hornet but not kill the other bees. 
Yeah. Which is really cool. And it's they amazing. just vibrate, right? They yeah. Yeah, generate meanwhile, heat. The virtue. honeybees in the U.S. have no defenses against these. No, things. this is one very specific subspecies in Japan mm. um, that can do this. Right. And so that's, for everybody who's listening and is panicking, if you are at all, hopefully, hopefully you've listened to our show enough to not listen to anything the media says. But... <laughs> If you're panicking at all, I don't think nobody's concerned about these things in terms of human welfare, right? These things are not murderers of people. They're murder, although you could potentially be killed by if enough of these stung you, just like honeybees, if enough honeybees sting you, you could die. And the sting is painful, right? It's big, it's scary, but it, no one's really worried about these from like a human welfare perspective. They're worried about honeybee colonies, and they, they, they are an invasive species. So you should always tell people this. There are more, more people who died actually from honeybee or hornet stings compared to people who died from like snake snake bites. Actually, that was very interesting. That would be something to look at. That's into. true. It's, it's, sure. They definitely yeah. do. So uh, uh, bees bee stings kill more people than snakes every year in the U.S. And yes. that, that's not to say that the Asian giant hornet is going to add to that list. And it's still a small number. It's like twenty five people a year killed by by bee stings in the U.S which is about twice as many who die from snake bite. But the the main thing I think we're worried about, it happened in Washington State, and that's a couple of states away from the main place in the U.S. where we use honeybees to pollinate most of our cash crops. So if it does get to California's Central Valley, and they start wasting the honeybee hives in the Central Valley of California, you can literally expect the price of a lot of the vegetables and fruits that you eat to go up. No more wine. A lot of that stuff relies on honeybees specifically as pollinators. Now, we have native bees that are pollinators, but in the Central Valley of California, it's so managed and so kind of destroyed and so heavily dependent on pesticides that um, honeybees are really the only ticket. So if these things start to affect honeybee populations in California, it's going to affect our economy in the long run. And so it really is kind of a time to panic, but not from a human health perspective. It's an invasive species, and so are honeybees, by the way. They're not native to the U.S. Yeah, either. It's that's a domestic right. animal. Yeah, <laughs> Our native bees we'll talk about a little bit, too, because honeybees in many cases can compete with our native bees. But, you know, for this one specific example in Central California, it's an important thing. And it's an invasive species either way, and the time is right now to make sure that they don't gain a foothold in North America. So right. in terms of panic, that's the, the impetus should be to go in there and annihilate these things before they take over. Because at a certain point, uh, when these things have gained a foothold, you can't eradicate them. It's just impossible. And they just got there, so now's the time to do it. So they really should be going there and finding every one of these things and making sure they don't gain a foothold. Because if they do, they're gonna, we're going to be stuck with them. Is there any hints on how they got there? They just buy a plane ticket? And- pretty much. I think it's pretty likely they, they get rides in big crates, those big containers, oh, yeah. right, with all kinds of crops and things like that. Right. And so they, they've already established in southwestern Spain and Europe. They've been oh, there wow. for a while. And they're past the point where they're expecting to be able to eradicate them. So Europe is pretty much stuck with them now. And now, so they missed the opportunity to go in there and nuke them when they first showed up. And we're there right now. So in that sense, it is kind of a panic mode thing. We need to go in there. We need to try to get rid of them. So uh, tell us a little bit more about honeybees and native bees. Well, I I have one more question about the the, the murder hornet here. Okay. So you mentioned the importance of eradicating these hornets. But I think a lot of people um, who are watching the news, they they might be compelled to go out and kill other things mm-hmm. that kind of look like this hornet. Yeah. Could could you describe exactly what this hornet looks like? How to distinguish it from like a yellow jacket or a common hornet that we find here in the states? Um, and also kind of give the listeners this message. I doubt it'll it'll get out here to West Texas, right? But it might. Uh, if, it's, if it's in Spain, it might be able to survive here. Anywhere where there's honeybees, I'll bet they could probably so. manage. Yeah. So but, the point being, don't go out and start killing yeah. wasps. And I don't want. When I'm saying important. the panic thing, and we should go in there and nuke them, I'm not saying you should go nuke them. Like <laughs> no. the common average. I'm talking about like the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I would only you know, that kind of thing. I would like when you. I got you to my. I like. Yeah, I got right on the floor. Okay, good call. So, 
yeah, describe what a, a murder hornet looks like. All right, so the main thing is the size. So murder hornets are about two inches long, and so most people's thumbs, so the width of the very first kind of section of your thumb where you bend it, uh, if you put two of those together, that's about how big. Big and wide, big, right? Big and pretty big. Yeah. yeah. And we, do we have any wasps or hornets that get that size or even come close? We do. Yeah. We have the tarantula hawk. We mm-hmm. have things like sand wasps that can get mm-hmm. quite large. Um, I think the main the main native one I'm thinking of that gets pretty close to the size that people might end up seeing um, is the cicada killer. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's a, that's kind of, uh, I don't really know that much about them, but they look a lot like a hornet. And uh, instead of like the tarantula hawk, where it goes after big tarantulas to feed its young, the cicada killer goes around harvesting cicadas, those things you hear buzzing during the desert heat, um, you know, uh, in the middle of the day. And they grab cicadas, sting them, shove them in a hole with their larvae like, like the tarantula hawk. And they're kind of this yellowish kind of golden orange look and they yeah. can be about at least an inch long maybe even like an inch and a half so yeah, we've got pretty sizable ones in the collection for yeah. sure um the best way to recognize a cicada killer is probably the patterning mm-hmm. that's on the body so they tend to have very distinctive markings that you can look up so if you were to just kind of google a cicada killer and put an asian hornet next to it you could probably tell the difference yeah. Pretty quickly, just by the banding. Patterns. And there are a lot of a lot of collections um, are putting out cool little um, diagrams and, and actual pictures from collections of all the lookalikes mm. next to each other. Yeah, and so the Auburn University Museum, I noticed they they had a cicada killer yellow jacket queens, which I didn't even know yellow jackets had a really giant looking queen, which is yeah. pretty crazy. I just know the soldiers or whatever are pretty. They're not anywhere near the size of a, of a cicada killer or an Asian giant hornet, but the the queens are. Um, there's already a European hornet that got here a long time ago that's not native that people see a lot and people could get it confused for the Asian hornet. It looks practically just like it, but it's smaller. Really? So, yeah, there's a lot of resources out there if you're like super concerned about it or just interested, seek out some of that information because when you see the lineup, you can really get an appreciation for how big yeah. this about. And don't, is. Don't, don't start murdering hornets and wasps. No. Because they are important. They They Serve a pr- pretty important function. In, yeah. Do you want to describe before our first break a little about the functions or, uh, of uh, them and the benefits? Yeah, what do hornets and wasps do? <laughs> yeah, because whenever like you walk in and you see, uh, you know, that hive there and, and they're starting to build their little family and their little legacy up there, you just immediately want to just kill, like, take them down or uh, with uh, dirt daubers too. When, whenever you see that those little clunks of dirt up in the corner of your awning of your house well what should they do what benefits uh, do they provide for people right so a lot of your wasps um, are actually also pollinators mm-hmm. they're not as efficient as say things like bees mostly due to the amount of like hair that's on the body so really bees are basically just really furry wasps mm-hmm. and so they're really good at picking up pollen a lot of your wasps can also pick up pollen they're just not as efficient so they are also technically pollinators um they also are a good source of biological control for other insects, since they do go out and pick up prey and use it to feed their young. So if you've got an invasion of some pests you don't like in your yard, like maybe you're an arachnophobe and you hate spiders, then spider wasps are your best friend. Because Mud they, will take, they will take care of those, those yeah. spiders for you. Oh, nice. So huh. they do have a lot of beneficial uses in our environment, for sure. All right. So, yeah, they're important. Don't go swatting at them or, or trying to squish them. They're, they're serving a purpose out there, even though they they look terrifying and, and they could sting you. Um, think before you zap them with a can of Raid, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we got about a minute left uh, on this. And uh, I know after the break, are we going to get to tarantula hogs? Yeah, we're going to talk about some of <laughs> my our, favorite. I think we'll get into our native bees a lot, but I think it might be worth reiterating from biological control perspective. One thing I thought of is that this Asian hornet, if it actually got rid of European honeybees in the U.S., it actually, and then went extinct, it actually would be a very good thing for our native bees. Oh, it, it would, it's kind of the ultimate biological control for honeybees. And I'm not that big of a fan of honeybees. We have a ton of really beautiful, really cool, effective pollinators that are native. And there's some evidence that honeybees actually cause declines in our native, in our native uh, bee you know, fauna. And so I, I'm still, I'm not going to sit here and say, though, oh, this is a great thing because they're going to come in here and wipe out you know, the invasive European honeybee, which is what we have. 
because we don't know what else it might do. It might then just go and start switching and killing all of our native bees. So I say it's not worth the gamble. We got to go in there. And the appropriate trained people got to go in there and get this thing uh, taken care of before it does take off because we don't know what it could do. And we're going to talk more about all of those really cool native bees in our next segment. So stick around, Science Nights in the Morning. So welcome back. We have talked me about Asian hornets and also invasive species and um, like what? So you're talking about hawks, like tarantula hawks, and you call these weird obsession with that. <laughs> so Lauren, please tell us more about this tarantula hawks and how they hunt and whatever they do. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and tell us more about tarantula hawks and how they hunt. Okay, so the tarantula hawk, uh, genus Pepsis, uh, is a type of wasp that's very large, very beautiful, blue, shiny, iridescent coloring, these really bright orange wings. And their life cycle begins with the female uh, paralyzing a poor tarantula. So it'll take its ovipositor that's full of venom and inject that paralyzing agent into a tarantula. Um, and in the process of trying to wrangle this tarantula, they tend to do kind of this hypnotic dance um, mm. to try to wow. uh, kind of distract the tarantula. So uh, that's an interesting kind of property that some people think might be why they have these interesting shiny orange wings. Mm -hmm. um, so after they've injected the paralyzing agent, they will bring it, usually shove it underneath a dark rock yeah. of some sort. Um, and then they it's will- Still wait. alive, right? Still alive, so yeah, paralyzed. Really yeah. So still alive, but cannot move. Uh, it's pretty, pretty wild. And uh, we'll lay a single egg on top of the tarantula. Um, and then after a while, it will fly away, uh, kind of try to cover its tracks, so nothing else will go into that hole because there are things like hyperparasitoids, for example, that will go in and try to use that paralyzed tarantula for their own purposes to rear their own young. Um, so after that happens, the egg hatches into larvae which burrow through the uh, exoskeleton of that poor tarantula and kind of eat it uh, from the inside out. So they burrow through and then start to eat the insides of the tarantula. While, so it's, it's, while it's alive. While it's still alive. While it's still, if that's not yeah. metal, I don't know what it is. It sounds like <laughs> a, that is metal. Sci-fi. Yeah. It's, it's like Iron Maiden t-shirt. That is not metal, metal for so, the poor tarantula. And after that... Um, <laughs> it's not. It's not metal for the poor tarantula tree. <laughs> And then after that, uh, once the uh, host, the larvae, have eaten everything that they want out of the tarantula, so they depleted the host completely, um, they will leave the tarantula and pupate, and then they will uh, turn into their full-fledged adults. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> that is and too can, cool. They're pretty common around here. You can see them all around West Texas. And, and uh, Thomas, you've actually seen these things in action. I've seen plenty of tarantula locks, but never actually seen one um, dragging its prey. I've, I've seen it twice. Um, the first time I saw it, I, I basically saw the whole process other than the you know, larvae burrowing into the, the tarantula. But the first time I saw this was down in South Texas. I was fishing on a risaca, and here walks this tarantula, and sure enough, I see the tarantula hawk nail it with its stinger, and I stopped fishing at that moment <laughs> and just watched everything that happened. And it took a few seconds, and that tarantula did what spiders do when, when they die. It kind of flipped over and curled up, mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, still alive. Um, and I actually watched the tarantula hawk drag it into the grass. Now, I don't know if it pulled it down a hole or what, but, um, you know, we can assume what happened after that. And then the second time, I kind of, I kind of saw the later part of the process after the wasp had dispatched the, the tarantula. It was just kind of dragging it across. This is out here in West Texas. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's it's really alien, mm -hmm. and it was and it was a great show. It, it lasted about ten minutes from the point of the wasp nailing the the tarantula to when it was dragging it off, and uh, it uh, distracted me from fishing for a while, which is pretty unusual. But that's a great occurrence. I mean, yeah, what are the cool. chances you actually witness the whole yeah, process? Yeah, twice. Yeah, that's people cool. and people freak out a lot about tarantula hawks, but what I think is kind of cool about them is that they're they're super unobtrusive when they're flying around or doing their thing. They're, they're really calm. I have never had one. You know, some 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 wasps and things will you know occasionally they'll just kind of seemingly go out of their way and sting you. You know, you're near the, their uh, hive or whatever. Those things are just minding their own business, and they can be pretty. You can get pretty close to them. 
and they do not mess with you. Yeah. They're, they're curious they're, too, which yeah, is they're really they're really hard to piss off, which is kind of and their their sting is extremely painful. Yeah. There's YouTube's videos out there for you if you if you are into that sort of thing. Yeah. On the pain scale, it's like one of the top numbers, right? In, in I the can't world. remember, but you know, remember. yeah, yeah I've all seen Coyote Peterson. Um, I think this is why the topic is so popular is because of Coyote Peterson, this, this yeah. guy on on YouTube who basically gets wasps and things to sting him, and he has a pain. Scale and yeah. I think the the bullet ant and the tarantula wasp are, are at the top of his pain scale. But yeah, um, that yeah. one's a, an interesting one because he's when he does the tarantula hawk, you can see how reluctant the tarantula hawk is. Yeah. He, he he's holding it with a pair of forceps and he's forcing it onto his arm. And it's just trying to get away, and it's even moving its abdomen like away from his arm. And then, like after like a good twenty five seconds of hassling this thing, it's like okay, jerk off. Yeah, and it, and it nails. Well, he did it wrong. You should have dressed up like a tarantula. Right. He has the wrong costume instead yeah. of a moron. Yeah. You should have dressed up like a tarantula. You should have gotten a, a special glove. Yeah. yeah. A tarantula a little, little tarantula glove. There. Sweet. Well, yeah. this is great. Yeah, excellent. So yeah. that gets your tarantula hawks fix? Yeah, I got my fix. It's Good. definitely a tarantula hawks, definitely my all time favorite. Insect. You brought up the, you brought up the mud dauber earlier. You know well, about the those dirt guys? Dauber. Yeah, dirt yeah. daubers. Yeah. yeah. They, for those of you guys listening, don't know what we're talking about. Any any kind of shed out in the woods that you've ever seen in the, in the eaves, um, up underneath rocks and things like that, big rock outcrops, you'll see those long tubes of what look like clay. Yeah. And these are from uh, wasps that go around nailing. Have you ever actually dug one open to oh, see yeah. what they're feeding? Yeah, on? they look they look like uh, whenever you break one open. It's just a ton of little holes. It's so intricate. There's yeah, all yeah. these little. What, what's in? Have you ever seen what's actually in the chambers? Uh, chicken nuggets, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly there's right. A, there's a there's a special prize when you open them. Yes, little one. little pieces of spider. So tell parts. them tell them what's in those chambers, Lauren. Oh, so inside those chambers are host provisions. So first, the uh, mother wasp will shove. Uh, spiders or whatever post provisions they have paralyzed into the nest chamber wow. and then they will lay an egg in there and then that egg will hatch and then they will yeah. consume the it's usually spiders inside. if you want to know what kind of spiders are found locally around the area where i just go find dirt dauber mud dauber uh colonies and and just dig them open and you'll each one has got like a nasty spider in it wow. so these things are going around, they're pretty metal too and they're going around and they're not just getting one spider right uh like a tarantula hawk which is pretty cool because it's so enormous, right? right? They're they're going and harvesting, you know, dozens of little spiders and, and and chambering them up. Yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around what Thomas saw, like a tarantula hawk dragging a huge, mm-hmm. you know. Now I could, it's a little bit more. I could see like you know a, a dirt dauber taking a smaller spider, you know, one of those smaller insects. Yeah. Into, inside proportionately, one of those it's smaller. It's about the same ratio proportionally. Oh, really? Because mud daubers are much smaller than a, a, a tarantula. Yeah. Well, they, they, they get big old spiders. They tend to get multiple spiders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they go back and forth and back and forth. Mm-hmm. So they put multiple spiders per each uh, larvae they're trying to rear. So things like your um, shiny blue Mud daubers tend to be very specific on things like black widows, so hmm. things in that family. Oh, wow. So if you've got those shiny, pretty, beautiful iridescent blue mud daubers with the black wings, um, they're typically attacking those are black things widows, like taking out black, black widows. Oh, yeah. Man, oh man! That's See, black cool. widows are creepy. I can handle a wasp, and they're <laughs> everywhere yeah. around here. Black yeah, widows they're, are they're common. Right I have to spray for them, sadly, but um, you know. I- What's up, Honor Bond? I cannot handle mouses with it. I, I find centipedes and little kids creepy in black. Really. Yeah. I don't know. Centipedes are pretty crazy. crazy. I saw a lot of those uh, this weekend when I was hiking. There's a lot of uh, millipedes and centipedes yeah, out. Yeah, they come out when it starts to rain, it seems. Yeah. Yeah. So I, what about okay. more more cool native spiders? What are, what are your sorry, not spiders, <laughs> uh, wasps, <laughs> wasps, bees, hornets? Uh, what are your what are your favorite hymenopteran? My local? favorites. Um, I love the cuckoo wasp. Cool. So huh. cuckoo wasps are super interesting. They're these beautiful green, blue, iridescent, tiny little wasps that are also parasitoids. Can hypo- you look that up? Or kleptoparasites. Yeah. I've never heard of this. Cuckoo so wasp. parasitoids, Cuckoo you're going to have to tell our listeners what a parasitoid so, is, and then uh, you're going to have to tell them what a kleptoparasite is. Yeah, right. so a parasitoid is an insect that consumes the bodies of other insects, typically larvae, so the immature uh, parts of the insect. 
Um, so as part of their development, so they kill immature uh, insects. Um, so things like cuckoo wasps, typically are what we call kleptoparasites. So these are insects that go into the hives of other insects and will kill the uh, larvae in there and then eat all the provisions that are supposed to be for that larvae. So they steal wow. the food of the... Uh, yeah. uh, and that's, but that's not the, quite the... So the larvae, they, they, they drop off their larvae with other larval insects? Yes. And that's why it's like a cuckoo, because a cuckoo comes by and drops its eggs off with, with another bird's nest. And then the, but do the other, do these uh, colonial wasps that they're dropping them off with, or whatever kind of insect they're dropping them off with, do they actually feed the little babies? Well, so the ones that I've seen in my project that I did, um, I was looking at mostly solitary wasps. Mm -hmm. And so typically the cuckoo wasps would sneak in there yeah. when the mama wasp was gone. And kind of dump her larvae in there. Yeah. Um, sometimes and then does the other mom take care of the larvae? No, because she's already yeah. provisioned. So in that way, it's not like a cuckoo, but it's it's yeah. similar. I guess. It's similar. They typically won't uh, kill the other larvae that are in there. They right. just uh, steal their provisions and basically outcompete the larvae that's in that nest. Yeah. And it yeah, sounds like a really pretty one. Yeah, they're beautiful. Oh, yeah. cow, that's a looker. Yeah, very iridescent, many many different colors, like like you're describing. And uh, quite, quite cutie, quite yeah. a little cutie there. Yeah. yeah. So. Other, the other bees I think of when I think of really pretty, that's the other thing I like about our native bees. Uh, when I, I don't know anything about these, you're going to have to tell me about them, but I always, <laughs> the common name I always hear about them is the solitary bees. Oh. And these are really beautiful. They're, they're, they look a lot like a honeybee in terms of its overall um, kind of body proportions, but they're like, they come in all kinds of beautiful colors. It's like bottle yellow ones, green ones, and blue ones. And they're just gorgeous. And I don't know why they're called solitary bees, and I don't know anything about them. So here's your opportunity to teach me something. Okay, so solitary wasps are not, and bees are not your typical eusocial right. insects. So these are insects where there's a mating pair, so a mom and a dad, mm -hmm. and uh, they mate, and then the mom creates a nest, so a single nest. So she doesn't have all these worker bees right. or drones. And that's helping like in her the out. ground where she so puts, some, puts in the ground uh, a lot, and then also inside of twigs, inside mm -hmm. of stems. So some will hollow out wood too for their nests. Um, a lot of the diversity we have out here is actually in the ground. So we have a lot of ground nesting bees and wasps that will dig their, these nests into the ground and then create little pockets in the ground. And that's where they put each one of their uh, host young and then bring the provisions inside of there. And are they, are they raising up a huge brood of a bunch of babies or just like a couple? Um, anywhere between like typical brood may, might be four to 12 Okay, so way less, like n none of these humongous hives, like a, like a honeybee with all these. Yeah. So much more kind of a, almost like the way we do it as mammals. Yeah, Just a, a mating <laughs> pair and a few young. So the, the solitary bees, ground nesters, maybe sticking their larvae in, in little uh, plant material. Are those kind of our, our primary native bees in the U.S.? Mostly, yeah. Do they belong so, to like a, a, a unique family? That... Um, there's a number of different families. So the most common ones that we have out here are probably the lifted bees. So those are those pretty metallic ones you're talking about that are green and blue. Um, and these are also called like sweat bees, might mm. be a term that you're used to hearing. So um, those are probably our most prolific family. Um, What's the diversity like in the U.S.? Do we have like a, a huge number of unique uh, bees in the U.S.? Is it like we have a lot of other things? Right. So out in the southwest deserts in the U.S., typically considered one of the uh, largest biodiversities of your bees. So oh, native, wow. Native bees, specifically strep-strait nesting bees mm -hmm. and yeah. parasitoids. So we live in a region that has a lot of diversity yeah. for bees. I feel like we really need to get the word out about our native bees because they're really they're gorgeous and they do a lot of cool things. I don't know that much about them. So every now and then you'll see like this poster that's like native bees and it's just beautiful. They're, they're all so gorgeous and I can honestly say I don't think I've ever been stung by a native bee. Like they're just they're a lot more innocuous even than yeah. like honeybees which are pretty innocuous. They don't really do that much either. But um, they're pretty harmless and just beautiful, almost more like a fly the way they, they operate. You know, if, you, if you go and look in a cactus and watch one in bloom, that's a good way to see one. You'll see, you'll see these native bees going in and out of cactus flowers, and you'll see how beautiful they are. One thing that I thought was really cool 
somebody did a comparison of um, native bees as pollinators versus honeybees as pollinators in the eastern U.S. Mm -hmm. And the eastern U.S. is destroyed, right? It's all, there's pastures, there's uh, little tree lots, uh, there's hardly any native vegetation um, that's not impacted. And it turns out in places like Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, native bees, even though it's destroyed, can uh, just as effectively pollinate all of our crops as honeybees. So kind of getting to that idea that the, the honeybees, like people, when people talk about conservation of bees, they're almost always talking about this non-native domestic bee that we imported from Europe. Mm -hmm. And the, the fear is, oh, colony collapse disorder. What happens to our bees? And no one ever talks about our native bees. In the Central Valley of California, honeybees are the thing. They move them around in trucks. They do all the work. And it's very important work. And your, you know, your, your vegetables and fruits would skyrocket in price if people had to go around pollinating those flowers. But in other areas of the country, our native bees can do the job. We don't need honeybees. Uh, which I thought was really cool. A lot of times the honeybee proponents will say, no, the honeybee does it best and we need to keep them around. It's like, no, in some areas, even places that are heavily human modified, destroyed, mm. like Pennsylvania and New Jersey, our native bees can still do the work, which is pretty cool. Well, here, here's, a, here's a question. So another economic concern with that is if we did away with the honeybees, you mentioned that a lot of the native bees are, what's the term you use, a social or, or solitary? Solitary. solitary. Um, are there any native bees that are colonial, like like honeybees? Because we, the name honeybee, we harvest honey from them as well, so we yeah. don't just use them as pollinators. That's a good point. Yeah. Would we be totally out of honey if we got rid of the honeybees, or is there a, 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 a native species that would actually do the same thing? Not one that I'm aware of. So the mechanisms that the native, most native bees use pollen and uh, eat nectar is very different than what honeybees do. So honeybees take up that nectar and they make honey with it to provision their young. Most of your native bees are taking that nectar and pollen as their own food source and then also uh, using pollen to create the uh, food for their young. Yeah. Um, and so typically with honeybees, the concern is with their effects on native bees is that Honeybees will go to a flower and they will take every single last tiny bit of nectar that's in that flower. They suck it all up because mm -hmm. honey is a really energetic, um, expensive thing to make. And so they need all the nectar that they can get. And what that means is that there's pretty much nothing left for native mm -hmm. pollinators. So native pollinators like um, lifted bees actually don't take all the nectar or all the pollen when they go to flower to flower. Mm -hmm. And that's what allows that balance to remain between all the different types of species that we have. Um, but honeybees will just take everything, all the nectar and all the provisions. And so that's affecting there. Yeah, line. it's a good point because we don't, we don't necessarily want a world without honey either. But I think uh, the balance you mentioned is a good thing. It's almost like, you know, cattle. Cattle can destroy uh, ecosystems in the West. If you do it right, it doesn't have to. It would be a good thing to have a balance where you had like native herbivores like bison that were more on the menu to where we could have, kinda have our cake and eat it too. So there's areas where uh, honeybees don't seem to influence the native bee populations very much and where they can probably both coexist. And there's other areas where they severely impact pack them. I think the Southwest is one of the areas they're particularly worried about because there's so much diversity of native bees and there's so little, uh, you know, to go around, so little resources for, for all those bees to compete for. And of course, there's places like the Central Valley of California where it's so destroyed that you don't, you can't have native bees. They just don't, they can't, they, they use so many pesticides there that there's basically no native bees in the Central Valley of California. And that's a place where you, you basically have to have honeybees to get the work done. So I think these are all cool issues that we're bringing up that uh, hopefully I doubt that many of our listeners have ever heard any of this stuff. It's no, yeah. pretty exciting. No, um, it's the first time I'm really hearing about it. So yeah. it's a fascinating you know, world yeah, out there. I, even I did not know there was this uh, difference between native pollinators and honeybees. I had already assumed that honeybees were like all over the world kind of thing. Yeah, they, they're not like, and honeybees yeah. are all over the world. They've been transported all over the world. Where they're native, yeah. you know, in Europe and in Asia, you know, these are kind of totally different issues that we've talked about in, in their native range. But it is it's important to recognize that honeybees are a domestic animal in the same sense that cows are. They've undergone, you know, hundreds of years of domestication to be the way they are. And so it makes them pretty different, especially from in North America. Like you were saying, Lauren, there was not really a big colonial bee 
um, like that that did the same thing. And we're going to keep talking about this cool stuff. We hope you like it. Um, we're going to wrap up this segment and talk more about our native bees after this break. All right, everybody. What is going on? We are back. Special guest Lauren is in the house with Dr. Sean Brand, Dr. Anurban Bhattacharji, and Dr. Thomas Schiller. And uh, I had a question for you, Lauren. Um, uh, a long time ago, I got you know, in 4-H a little entomology pin that I got to wear, and I was very proud of it. My sister has one, too. She still wears it right now. She's probably wearing it right now. But uh, anyway, uh, so uh, the, the instructor that gave us that pin was very, very offended whenever I would call uh, an insect a bug. And Why would you even do that? I know, I know. <laughs> You're making Jeez. me nauseous. It, it's terrible, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's absolutely great. It ludicrous. Sickens my stomach. Someone like Bugs Bunny, and the next step is just sending Bugs Bunny is the same thing as a bug. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah, yeah, yeah. the poly wear is red as a skull. What's up, Doc? But, I mean, that brings me to my question. Um, what, is there a difference between a bug and an insect, or are they, like, I don't know. What are they? Oh, so technically, scientifically speaking, they are not interchangeable oh, insect okay. and bug. So insect refers to everything that is in class insecta. So all your different types of insects. And then technically, the only bugs there are are true bugs, which is a particular order of insects. So mm-hmm. all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. Interesting. So, so like the bugs in a bug's life, the, the Pixar film. I'm not sure nope, there's actually there's any... Of, there's they're all insects, right? Right. Oh, that's a good question. Actually, are there any bugs? I, I don't think there are. Yeah, yeah. I really don't, I, I don't I, think it's so. It's funny. She talks... <laughs> we, you know, when I emailed her about this, I think uh, she said that we're going to talk about bugs. And so she's not the you know uber nerd who, who would get offended by that. And I'm, I'm the same way. Like when people talk... I talk about um, critters. Critters. You know, you know I'm going to go find critters when I'm looking for snakes. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Right. You know? Yeah, that's a polyphyletic term. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot actually, of snobs out there. Actually, yeah, actually snob critters are only a, a specific genus of <laughs> creepy crawlies. <laughs> yeah, creepy ca- crawlies being a monophyletic. Group. Yes. Oh, exactly. trust me. And being on the radio, I get calls all the time of uh, you know people get highly offended with that. Yeah. Hopefully, there's no one out there listening who's going to be offended. One day, we're going to get big enough to where we're going to have these people, uh, you know. <laughs> All the time, to have a coalition Actually, against you us, know what trying to bring us said. down. Yeah, we need an automated response. It's like, um, thank you for your thoughtful <laughs> question. We will be getting back to you soon. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, kind of, we have a, about ten minutes left to. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about murder hornets. We've talked a lot about the big flying insects out there and uh, their benefits, right, uh, to us. Now, just one quick question that uh, I'm sure our listeners have, because we have a lot of uh, folks out there, you know, they're outside mowing the lawn, they're, they're just taking care of their house, you know, and um, if they see, like, something just hanging off the awning, and they don't want to kill the, the insects, is there, are there ways to go around that? Relocate them? Yeah, can they yeah, uh, relocate, relocate them? It's probably the best. Yeah, option. there's a great. I want to tell you guys about a great trick. This is, everybody okay. should know about this. this. Is what I do. You know, I'm the person responsible for getting rid of nasty wasps and bugs. killing spiders. And spiders. And and I, I don't kill them. Um, and what you need is a, you need a like a Dixie cup or a glass and a piece of paper. And there's a smooth move you can do. You go, you grab uh, the Dixie cup or the glass and you put it over the uh, perpetrator. And then you slide the piece of paper under between the perpetrator and the glass underneath the glass. And, and it'll just lift its little legs up and it'll be between. And then you got this piece of paper between you and the, uh, yeah. the you know, suspect. <laughs> and then you walk out into your front yard and you just let it go. And then you walk back inside. Well, what I was thinking and imagining is this bright, big, beautiful hive with a whole bunch of eggs in there. A wasp nest, oh, right? Like where the wasp was yeah. already set yeah. up residence. And, and so I just take children. Right I take there. my garden shears and I, I oh, sh- you know, shear the, the edge of it. And then I take it and they're like all following me and we're all friendly together. And we're, you know, symbiotic within this yeah. realm. Then, that you, we call then you pound some Benadryl. <laughs> you know, Benadryl. All you need then is you, is you scale up my, my system. You need, you need a pickle bucket. Okay. And a cardboard box. 
Okay. <laughs> and then you can do the same thing. But I can't just, I have to like put a nail or like no. duct tape it up. What I would say is I, I did this. Um, a wasp was making a, a nest on top of a bottle that I was going to take to recycle. Oh, cool. And I did, it was right next to where we park our cars. And I thought, I'm not going to do anything. And that's that's an important thing for people to start to get used to doing. I think live and let live. It's amazing yeah. when you, and I know it's it's a whole different ball game if you got children because children are more vulnerable. So uh, you know, some black widows may or may not have gotten a death sentence at the Hacienda del Gran recently. <laughs> but uh, when it's something like a wasp and this thing, I just said, you know what? It, it's starting to it's starting its little nest there. I'm just going to let it go. I'm not just going to take that bottle to the recycling. And I'm going to pass by it every single day in my truck. And I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to let it. And it never stings you. Yeah. And that's, I think that's the important part is that people, it's the same thing with rattlesnakes, mountain lions, all those things. If you, if you can learn to live and let live, it's an amazing level of enjoyment for nature that you can start to have. Instead of like what we talk about where you bring these city kids from Houston out to the desert for the first time and a fly goes past their nose and they jump off the <laughs> and they lose their minds yeah. and start doing the you know the boogie, the fly swap boogie. Yeah, I think I think more people probably injure themselves trying to get away from from wasps and things yeah. that might sting them than just letting them You can always tell the students people. who've never been outside by the fly swap boogie. Yeah. Even ones that have been outside. You know, I've had senior level geology students who who've been hiking for years and they see a little wasp. It's it's like a phobia almost. They see a little wasp fly up and they just scream and go running off. And <laughs> well, there, there's some kind of traumatic great. event that may have happened. Have y'all ever been stung by? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. y'all y'all been all stung. Honeybees, How many yeah. times at one time? At one in one setting? Once. One just once. I got probably maybe stung maybe six times in the head by yellow jackets. Yellow jackets. Because I was standing on their nest. Oh, you're standing. They're in the ground, so. You know, they come spilling out, and you're looking around where the hell they're coming from, and you're standing on their nest, and that's where oh, they're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Tom? Yeah, I think maybe three or four times by a yellow jacket. I was yeah. crawling to get a ball underneath my grandpa's porch. and got Oh, when you were a kid. Yeah, behind the behind the knee. Yeah. It was, it was not pleasant. Yeah, yeah, every single day going into school, I'd always get stung on the neck like a few t- like good amount of time. Always have to miss the first day of school. And then uh, just recently, I got stung... 20 well about three four years ago got stung 24 times i did run i hit a hole shattered my ankle had oh. two years of rehab oh. whoa Ooh. see yeah that's, so it's like trauma. <laughs> yeah the, the the escape was worse than that. it was it was a lot worse the, I, I won't do that again i'll the, just get the, stung. the thing i've discovered when it comes to wasps bees whatever um it may be tempting especially if it's something like a yellow jacket that's buzzing in your face and is a very aggressive looking thing to swat at it, but especially with bees, I've found if you just stay still and go about what you're doing, even if the thing lands on you, try not to freak out because the second you swat at it, and I think with bees, they release like a pheromone or something, right, that will tell all the other bees it's time oh, to yeah. attack and defend the, the hive. Wow. Um, and we almost got into some trouble out of Pinion Mountain in, in the National Park. I had a group of like eight students, and one of them sat on a bee. And the rest of the bees came in and basically ended our day in the field because it was one student who was swatting at the bees. But anyway, that's what I always tell my students is just don't mess with them. Like yeah. they're mean looking, but try not to swat at them and they won't mess with you, right? Yeah. Honor Bond, have you ever been stung? I've been stung once when I was like three or four years old. I remember it pretty vividly. And it's pretty funny because I was at a wedding and I thought this thing that was sitting on one of my uncles, uh, back was a mosquito so i thought this is a really big mosquito so i just slap it off i'm just imagining <laughs> little baby honor bun well oh, this is a good idea swat yeah I try to swat. and i remember my like pump swelling off like really really big and somebody taking the sting out of it and that's all i remember i don't remember what it was that found me but i definitely know it was like, I don't know what or on it or something. So, <laughs> so I have I have a question. So we can I've thought of a good way to end this on a positive note since we just have a couple of minutes. What's everyone's favorite bug? Where I'm going to use I'm going to use the the term bug. Okay, favorite insect <laughs> bug. Let's start with you, Conley. What's your Me? favorite? Oh, y'all already know that tarantula. It's, it's wasp. A tarantula. tarantula huh? Huh? All right. What about you, Honor Bun? Firefly. Firefly. Yeah, it's a good yeah, one. Yeah. All right, Dr. Graham. Uh, hawk moths. 
The Sphinx moths yeah. are incredible. Good choice. They're really cool. <laughs> they're, I call them, uh, they're glorified and, and honorary vertebrates. They're so cool. <laughs> they're quite big. <laughs> I don't know if I'm familiar with those. Are they... They're these huge yeah, moths no, that have, they, they look like hummingbirds when they're flying. And they uh, have the eyes on the wings? Yeah, we're looking at a, no. a, a photo of them. Usually not. Yeah, they're not like those. And, and they have humongous long tongues for pollinating like uh, orchids. And they're different than luna moths. Is, yeah, they're, they're different from luna moths. They do well. kind of look like hawks or something. Yeah. They, like a lot of times you see them, they look like a hummingbird. They'll come out, uh, the day flyers fly around flowers during the day and they look just like hummingbirds. They have the same uh, kind of abilities as hummingbirds in terms of the wig bee. It's yeah. incredible. Wow. And even some of them are, um, they're, they're essentially endothermic. The wings get them warm enough to where they can maintain a constant and warm body temperature, and that's how they can sustain that flight. So that's, oh, that's awesome. they, they're the only, uh, well, for a while, they're the only kind of animals that could actually see color at night. Wow. But actually, now we know some geckos can do that, too. So they don't have that super. <laughs> cool. But they're pretty, they've got a lot of superlatives. They're pretty neat. What about yours? Yeah. And then we'll end with Lawrence. I, yeah. My favorite is the mantis wasp. Oh, those are really, those are really cool. And I'm going to leave some time for Lauren because I think she can probably yeah. give some more details <laughs> about her favorite. Or she might have to think about it a little bit. No, I'm like, uh, yeah, check it out. Mantis mm-hmm. wasp. Oh, nice. The Neuropterin. So a, a nerve wing insect that pretends to look like a mantis but is not a mantis or oh, related wow. to a mantid. So mm-hmm. those are cool. Uh, my favorite insect is the bee fly. That's what my master's degree was over. And bee flies are those types of flies that look a lot like bees, so you might mistake them for a fuzzy bumblebee. Um, but actually, they parasitize a lot of different insects, including bees. So they are uh, parasitoids, like we mentioned earlier, so insects that feed on a lot of other insects. Mm-hmm. And uh, my project was focused on their relationships with our native bees and wasp populations and seeing what their effect was. So they're very cute. Yeah, they look um, like a Pixar character. Yeah, they, they do. Really do. They, they... There's, there's a Pokemon. Oh, oh no. well, so oh, really? So oh. They're real furry and, and real cuddly. <laughs> Just want to kind of. pollinators too, right? They are, yeah. yes. So, Lauren, uh, right before we head out, can you tell people about like a local event around here that if people are interested in insects, they might be able to attend in the near future? So, out here, usually during the spring at the Chihuahuan Desert Research Institute, um, on your way towards Fort Davis, usually late April or, uh, or early April or late March, we do a Bugs, Bugs, Bugs program that's uh, in conjunction with Soros, Soros Biology Club. And it's an event where uh, third graders and fourth graders get to come to the nature center, and uh, we teach them all about different insects and bugs. So it's pretty. So yeah, it sounds educational. When apocalypse is over, <laughs> look forward to the next bugs, bugs, bugs next spring. Thank you so much for being here, yeah, Lauren. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. We'll talk great great work. Stuff. Yeah. And we will be back next Saturday with a new topic on Science Nights in the Morning every Saturday morning, 10 a.m. KVLF Alpine. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.